year as part of our annual uh, faculty student conference. Um, Mr. Charles is from Minnesota. He's been a freelance writer for 33 years, and we will not hold it against him that his son goes to Normandale. <laughs> Um, yes, we will. He graduated with honors in 1977, the same year that I graduated from Iowa State University. Um, did I say he graduated from Harvard? No. What? Oh, he usually did call here, today. No, just next I guess. Okay. <laughs> graduated from Harvard with honors in 1977, the same year that I graduated from Iowa State University. Uh, I went on to teach writing at a rural Iowa high school. He went on to attend Texas University, uh, Texas Law School, write helicopters during maintenance of high voltage power lines, go under the wreckage of the World Trade Center, tour a night Brisbane Lutheran factory, and get involved in many other dangerous activities. All of these things he probably could have avoided if he had simply only gotten the kind of education that I had gotten in Iowa State, which is to stay in trouble. Um, he writes about all these really incredible experiences he has, plus the history of engineering, in his 2001 book, Inviting Disaster Lessons from the Edge of Technology, and he's going to be talking about uh, some of that today, um, which he looks at, and he's going to be talking about today, I think, the Titanic, airship disasters, uh, the chemical spill of Bhopal is part of the book, and he argues that many of these disasters take place for a lot of different reasons, poor communication, poor design, and especially the almost impossible task of having someone who, with enough ability to foresee every eventual possibility working on projects. When I got my first journalism job in Mason City, Iowa, on the Globe Gazette, there was a teletype that used to ding in once in a while. And I asked the editor, I said, why? And it was just constantly churning up news. You know, this, you guys don't even remember this now, the paper was, right? <laughs> and, um, I asked the editor, I said, what do the dings mean? And he said, well, he said, if it's, you know, one ding, because they were like from one to five dings. And I said, he said, if it's one ding, maybe it's a car crash someplace. He said, if it's two dings, maybe there's a bad fire. He said, maybe three dings, there's an air crash. And I said, okay, I said, what about five dings? I said, what does that mean? He said, it means you get under the desk. <laughs> So, one of the things that um, uh, James is going to talk about today, I think, are those kind of five ding things, or what he calls imminent catastrophic events. The kind of things that you would not put in your drink, but you might get under your desk for. So, let's uh, give a real big round of applause to Mr. Charles. Thank you, Mark. 
camp along uh, in Pennsylvania. So that was one of the joys. I don't, you know, percentage of time pretty small to get to those sort of places, but it's a, a great opportunity. And what I try to do is bring their lessons from living in a dangerous world so that the rest of us can profit from that. And uh, I'm just a visitor. I don't spend much time in such places. And my wife's happy about that. Uh, so one of the places I had a chance to go into was uh, the wreckage of the World Trade Center about six months later. The building I was in is the uh, one shown here, which is World Trade Center 6, called the Customs House. And so I went in there with a very interesting guy named Pablo Lopez. They called him the Jacques Cousteau of the Trade Center site. A big guy, about six foot six, Peruvian. Uh, an engineer, I think some of you were engineering class in front music, civil engineer, worked for Muser Rutledge, and he's still in New York working for the guys. Uh, so uh, we didn't slither around anywhere, but uh, he was my guide, so that follow the rule and you stick with your guide. And if he says it's, it's time to go, that's the general rule of these places, uh, then you don't argue or anything because sometimes they will tell you it's time to leave. Uh, and uh, we were fairly fortunate because a, a floor fell in the next morning on one of the places that we were. Uh, so there's always some slight element of risk in doing these things, but at least they're able to tell their stories to me and I'm able to bring them back to people like you. And then you have your own uh, edgy adventures, I'm sure. So think about writing them up uh, when you have those things. It might be a, a close call from a car crash. Uh, I encourage people to keep a mistake diary. I do. Uh, so many times, uh, close calls. Uh, we'll write it down. Uh, remember it. Because, like Dave said, it's, um, he was talking about it would be great if you had people who could foresee every possible event. Well, that's not really my goal. It's more detecting when something, when that little needle is getting in the danger zone, in the red zone. And the good thing is often you have warning about that, that needle. You have time. Uh, for example, uh, I tell my kids, there's some places you will be in that are much more dangerous than any place I've been. And one of them is being stalled on the side of the interstate at night. Very dangerous place. Uh, all of a sudden, that needle has gone to a uh, high danger zone, or if you're stuck in smoke or fog on the interstate, the needle is instantly paid. You are in extreme danger. You need to get away from that highway. Just think of that car crash in Florida, uh, multiple car and truck crashes. So for people who know their world, you know when the needle is flipping just a little bit, or it's paid. Uh, and it can easily happen in, uh, in, uh, in our pedestrian world. So I encourage people uh, think about uh, the kind of risk that you might face. And a lot of them have to do with cars. Uh, my grandparents were killed in a car crash, so my paternal grandparents. Um, so when I pose this question, are we just ringing the lutein bell? Or have you all heard of um, uh, Lloyd's of London? You know, the insurance guys? Reinsurance is technically what they are. Uh, they have a big bell in Lloyd's in London. It's called, it's from the Lutein, which was a treasure ship that went down. And so they still keep that bell, and whenever the ship is lost, they'll ring the bell. I believe it's three times. And that puts the insurers on note that uh, the guys um, who put their money up, that they better hope that uh, they find the ship and they come back safe, because otherwise you're going to have to spend a lot of money. So that's a picture of the Lutein. So the question I ask myself and anybody who likes on disasters, is it just a voyeuristic thing? And there, unfortunately, that happens a lot. I would say maybe most of the time in the media, by voyeuristic, meaning you're really just covering it for excitement or emotion. I, I really am down on that notion because people have enough grief already without somebody writing about uh, how uh, painful and wrenching it was. In my book, Writing Disaster, the only time I went into much detail about the physical effects were uh, it was a 1998 Holodazzle crash. Do you all remember that? The Holodazzle parade, a van, uh, police van, uh, went out of control and uh, killed a couple people and sent one family into a plate glass window at the Excel uh, Energy Building. So I went into some detail on that and also attended the civil trial because. Again, car crashes are so close to what uh, in pluralist. So my goal is not to be voyeuristic or to chase after emotions. There's enough TV that does that already. But to distill the lessons, to try to, and often that takes time. Um, I think you mentioned the uh, truck, Three Mile Island. Uh, it was a subject of some 
unhappiness by the operators because they felt they were maligned, and now they've got the Simpsons. You know, Homer and the Springfield nuclear power plant. Um, and so it's kind of hard to talk to the operators because they feel they've got to stick together. Nobody really understands what happened at Three Mile Island. So I had to wait a few years before I was able to talk to one of the operators because he didn't want to be singled out. But he was really a hero in my mind, a guy named Brian Baylor, uh, because he was able to see into that very chaotic, scary event. And you'll see it mentioned down there, there's a term called Vujad, which Carl White made up. And uh, it's the opposite of deja vu. Are all familiar with deja vu? I feel like I've been here before. Well, vuja means I'm in a place where nobody has ever been. And uh, extremely scary. Uh, where you feel things are out of control, and uh, it's kind of like you're in the middle of the target. Uh, and not a target story either. You're in the middle of a bullseye. Uh, and that was the feeling they had at Three Mile Island. So it was pretty amazing that Brian Mailer with a half an hour before a complete meltdown, was able to come into that control center and figure out what was wrong and solve it. An outsider in a half an hour coming in with over 100 guys in the control room. I mean, to me, you know, that's a modern miracle. And of course, you've heard about many other modern miracles. Um, uh, Captain Sully and people like that. It's a long list, and uh, who knows, maybe you'll be one of those heroes. You certainly don't want to be one of the goats. Uh, think of what is a, what's a modern hell today, being literally in hell. Well, it'd have to be Francis Chettino, the captain of the arena. There he's confined to his house with a very unhappy wife. I mean, I'm sure he hears daily about what an idiot he was at the um, Costa Concordia. He went from a very fun life to a miserable life. So. Modern technology can do that for you. So better not to do it. So uh, what I write about is where heedlessness, and I'll stress that again later, not recklessness, uh, heedlessness, it's a pattern that I see the most often, where it combines and it, it leads to a series of events that, and that's why it's preventable, is that nearly always this tension kind of builds up, the fractures grow. Nearly always there's time to act. So that's why I'm kind of an optimist, as I see it all the time, where things are getting pretty close to a rather significant catastrophe. Somebody acts. They stop it. Uh, those are my heroes. Many of them have never been uh, in books. So the, uh, when you, they use the term, actually I have three different grades of that disaster, which is what you hear about most of the time. A catastrophe, which is where the, in Greek was originally a turning point. Catastrophe, if you're on the scene, can be be a house fire that you can't get out of. For you, that's a catastrophe. And a cataclysm is, is more what Dave was talking about, where there is uh, a major social change. Uh, say an asteroid comes along, or uh, in the northern Japan, I could probably call that a cataclysm, because people may never go back to their homes. That would probably be a cataclysm, as far as they're concerned. So uh, again, relating from the holodazzle, Accent, something that I commend to your attention. That <laughs> fellow that I talked with, a lawyer for the plaintiffs, told me something that um, has stuck with me, which is the nicest people you could hope to meet cause terrible accents, and it's really true. The uh, uh, driver, Tom Selena, in the Holodazzle parade was not a bad guy. He really wasn't. He was served in the Vietnam War. He was very interested in helping out the community. He made one mistake kill a couple of people, and he has to live with that. So it's not a matter of being a nice person or a mean person most of the time. It's not it. So the factors. Uh, talk a little bit about how the media treats disasters and then how a writer can do that. I have the luxury of coming along later and being able to pick and choose. So I don't want to cast aspersions on people who have to write daily news. I mean, you just don't, you're just not able to stand way back from it. Uh, and now we have blogs. I keep a blog called Disaster Wise, so I'm able to bring a little perspective uh, where I can. I, my latest post was on the James Cameron uh, drop into the Mariana Trench. I uh, hope that's, that's going to be a very successful non disaster, but he's learned from prior disasters and problems with submersibles in uh, deep water. So, we'll talk a little about disaster reports. Uh, these are the official ones I'm referring to here. Um, this picture may look like it's the deep water horizon. Uh, but it's not. It's called the Piper Alpha 1988, a, a gas 
processing and uh, gas removal rig in the North Sea that uh, caught fire, killed 167 people. And so that statue that you see, uh, I'd say that captured as much as anything, which is they're looking scared and confused and wondering what to do, and the people who survived tended to jump off about 100 feet into the ocean, because uh, otherwise it was pretty hard to make it out alive. But it kind of captures the confusion, the fear uh, of that bourgeois moment uh, stuck in the North Sea with a um, about 1,000 PSI of natural gas coming out of a pipe about three feet across. So they said it. I don't know if people know what a banshee sounds like, but they said it sounded like a banshee, uh, like a, a howl or a scream that you could hear for miles. The gas coming out of that pipe. Due to a couple of simple mistakes, uh, people who had closed off a, uh, uh, called a blind in the pipeline and processing industry, a blind is a kind of shield that you put over an open pipe, and they had not fully closed that off, nor had they told the next shift. We haven't finished the job. Do not turn the gas on on this particular pipe. All that communication fell short. So that's one of the patterns that I see, and you may see also. Often the trouble comes in a transition between one shift and the other. Often you'll find that. Another pattern is that mistakes happen late at night. It's another pattern due to fatigue. Uh, another pattern is uh, where you have external contract workers who are not really familiar with the incident. You see that a lot in petrochemical. So these patterns do tend to show up. Uh, and so book writers like me or bloggers, we can say, this is really nothing new at all. We've seen this pattern before. You usually see it in airline crashes. Uh, so um, this particular picture is of the West Pharmaceutical Explosion in Kinston, North Carolina. Very avoidable, uh, something the Chemical Safety Board has told people about for years, which is flammable dust that's been suspended uh, in the air. And it was a chain of events, not bad people, but many missed opportunities. In fact, people actually seen an inch and a half of dust up in the false ceiling, and not knowing who to talk to about it or why it was so extremely dangerous. Um, and occasionally you'll see these reports of a rain mill blowing up. Now, there's a major explosion in uh, Minneapolis. That's why they call it uh, the Mill City Museum. It's uh, the biggest dust explosion in the world as part of their historical legacy. These are very avoidable, these uh, dust explosions, but it does take some extra attention and care. So that, that, again, that pattern you see so often, it's heedless people, not reckless people. It's, now, of course, there's the Shantino factor. <laughs> I, I put him aside as far as recklessness for whatever personal reason he had to impress others. I mean, that would fall into the recklessness. But I, I recognize that pattern in the book. You'll see a mention of a Billy Hamilton, who was a steamboat engineer, and he loved to get into races with other steamboats. So uh, there's a documented incident of where he would keep hanging a weight on the steam valve, uh, on the wrench, to uh, keep the steam valve from lifting so he could raise the pressure in his boiler so that his steamboat could beat another steamboat on the Mississippi River. So when I heard about the Shatino information, I thought, there's Billy Hamilton. Exactly that kind of personality that died once excitement uh, for his own personal reasons is willing to put people in jeopardy. Fortunately, though, that's pretty rare. So uh, again, nothing new about this. There's a fellow who saw a lot of this back in the 1500s um, by the name of Venocio Berenguccio. And he wrote a book called The Pyrotechnia. Uh, and great book. I mean, it's, it's like if, if the world were to go to pieces, you'd want to have a copy of The Pyrotechnia because <laughs> it has all kinds of, of uh, easy descriptions that anybody can do about smelting metals and making all kinds of things uh, with 1500s technology, which is what you, know, you might end up with an asteroid arrives. So, uh, and here's what he said, Manocchio Bergucio, uh, 1540, um, really true today. Uh, he was warning people about the problems of uh, smelting metal and how you can hurt yourself. And he said, and particularly he was worried about uh, bad smelting or bad foundry jobs. Uh, his uh, princely sponsor asked him to write up some of these things, so that's why he wrote this book. Uh, he said, you must plan to spare no labor or expense and must be very careful and very patient in every detail in order to bring all the means which are to use to perfection. <coughs> Remember, this is the key phrase, the whole thing depends on small things. For example, a poorly made binding or an ill-fitted joint, the leaking of the mold to a crack. That is really true. 
they would be things added up. Uh, and that was a lesson of the uh, a wreck of the Quebec Bridge in 1907. And so there's a lot to be said for the principle, and I'll talk about uh, Hyman Rickover later, uh, head of the nuclear reactor program. But the general principle, um, if any of you can go to the Naval Academy or something like that eventually, is, uh, or the West Point, is principle was told me by one of the graduates is a leader has to know where the trouble is and that's where he or she goes. That's where leaders do. They go to the trouble and they stay there until it's resolved. Might have to delegate or whatever, but they go to the site, they stay there, they're personally responsible for the outcome. So that's one good indication if you have somebody who calls themselves a leader but they're not, is they're always trying to stay as far as possible from the trouble. It's a pretty good indication. Well, it was a pretty skilled engineer, but unfortunately it's very ill as the Quebec Bridge was getting ready in 1907 and there were problem reports, he was too ill to make it and he did not make it in time, he tried to stop the work, the message didn't get through, the bridge collapsed, killed about 80 guys. So it's a very unfortunate career to uh, end the career to an engineer who most of his life had done amazing things. He worked on the Eads Bridge in St. Louis. Um, so maybe there's a point at which if you as an engineer are unable to go to that site, you have to turn the work over to somebody else and say, I'm no longer able to leave because I can't go to where the trouble is. Another example of uh, not necessarily a leader, but an effective person uh, seeing the trouble was at the Baldwin Hills Dam in Los Angeles. Uh, you'll notice that sort of a gap there that uh, a fellow who was, uh, uh, he was a maintenance guy. But he had been told there's some things you really have to worry about with the Baldwin Hills Dam, and that's hearing the sound of rushing water. And one day he heard the sound of rushing water, and he went down to check. And sure enough, the earth was eroding away from a, a floodgate. And he knew, he had been told, and he knew from common sense that at that point, the clock is now ticking for a dam failure. And there are a lot of people that live downstream, thousands of people live downstream from the Baldwin Hills Dam. And so the system worked very well. Uh, they didn't say the dam, but he was able to talk to the supervisor. They checked on it immediately. They tried to stop the leak. They couldn't. They warned the police. The police went around. And this actually was the first incident involving a news helicopter, uh, was the breach of the Baldwin Hills Dam. So it's kind of historic in the other too. And they were able to minimize the damage because <laughs> they knew what the problem was. They knew the risk. They, uh, and they acted promptly. So it's really not all that complicated. It's a matter of knowing your world and knowing when that needle, that, that uh, danger zone, that's uh, it's entered or bed. Well, these guys do. So um, again, why an optimist is, that's an idea that I came up with for uh, the book called The System Fracture. Uh, it's distinguished from another common analogy you may see, which is the Swiss cheese wheel of James Reason. It's like rotating wheels with holes in them. Well, that's okay, but from my point of view, I like a system fracture concept. But what that means, I'll go into it. Uh, this is an actual picture of a ship that broke in half at the dock, which was pretty embarrassing, 1943, uh, called the Schenectady. Ships are not supposed to break up, just sitting at the dock. Now, there are a number of other Liberty ships and Victory ships that broke. Um, and it turned out the problem was fixable. Uh, I'll get into that in just a minute. But here's the principle of system fractures and beginning with metal fractures is every metal has a flaw and it. it doesn't matter how much you pay for it, whether or not NASA puts super effort into it, they always have flaws, little bits of slag, cracks at the microscopic level. And here's a crack you can see actually moving away from a piece of slag. So that's an actual picture. There it is. Okay, so uh, metal typically, um, if, you, if you stress it enough and you don't pay attention to this happening, that uh, you may have heard uh, 737 again lost part of its skin uh, over Arizona near Yuma. And a similar thing happened to Aloha Airlines. Uh, 737 losing a big chunk of its cabin. That's a metal fracture in action. So if you don't act on this, those cracks will grow and they'll get longer and they have time if you don't detect it. And then they'll keep going until it breaks. And one of the ways that people used to use to detect cracks and fuselages uh, was cigarettes uh, like tar, nicotine back when people would smoke in airliners. You could tell when there's a crack by, on the outside of the plane by looking for tar deposits. So that's a form of non-destructive testing. Well, you can't do that anymore because people aren't allowed to smoke. But there's plenty of other ways to detect that there's 
fracture. You may think, well, how could they possibly fly airplanes with cracks in them? And the answer is they do it all the time. Um, when I wrote my book, uh, The Dog Machine, about helicopters, I was very amazed that people who kept flying five and ten million dollar helicopters, these are, you know, top of the world, you know, king of society people, you know, pharmaceutical guys, whatever, uh, fifteen million dollar helicopters, you think their hel helicopter would have no cracks in it, right? <clears throat> well, they tolerate cracks too. Even a crack in the blade of the, the rotor blades has to you know, how can you put this back on the helicopter? And he said, we manage the risk, we put, uh, we mark it, we see how big the crack is. Of course, it's very small, you can barely see it. And we put a blade tape over it to keep it from being corroded. So he said, there's ways to manage it, and they, uh, they don't fail. But still, I was amazed. An actual crack in a high dollar helicopter. It's tolerable because they tracked it, they knew it, they knew everything about it, and they knew if they, well, they cost them a quarter million dollars for one thing to replace that rotor blade. So that's pretty persuasive. I can take that kind of risk for a quarter million dollars. I probably could pay me a quarter million dollars. Uh, so all the systems have weak points, something like a fractured piece of metal. But the key is, it's not the presence of a fracture, it's what you do about it. Do you track it? Are you fully aware of the world that you're in and the fact that there will be flaws? And the smart organization knows there will always be mistakes. They've uh, monitored airline pilots going across the ocean and there's typically a couple dozen mistakes as they go across the ocean. No big deal, though. Well, that's what humans, we do it, we fix it, we catch it. There's multiple pilots, hopefully, and they're not asleep, and they're not, and they're not flying over the Twin Cities. So most of the time, those two pilots watch each other. In that case, that was a, a distraction. Amazing that it could happen, but it did. That was the two pilots that flew over uh, the Twin Cities for like half an hour before somebody said, you know, why are we looking at Wisconsin now. Um, it, sometimes amazing things happen, but you think the total number of flights, it's a very small percentage. But why not learn from that small percentage? One thing, it's pretty darn interesting, and sometimes very scary. So uh, I call it the machine frontier. Um, sometimes very dramatic incidents, um, and, uh, and, and people lose their lives. So that cost has been paid, why not use it? Well, this is the San Bruno pipe explosion. And um, it was essentially a window into the manufacturing techniques of the 50s. And uh, the National Transportation Safety Board was not at all happy when they looked at these pipes to realize that in the 50s uh, there was some very shoddy manufacturing processes going on, like welds were only half thickness, uh, the pieces weren't lined up well. And the only thing that these guys had done, in, the, in these, not that all the welds were bad, but some of them were, was they had ground down the exterior so you couldn't tell how mismatched it was. And of course nobody really looked on the inside so you couldn't tell that the weld was only half penetration. Very bad work. So bad that you can see a welding rod on the inside. They left a chunk of welding rod on the inside of the pipe. I mean, how could you do such a thing? Um, so one pattern, I mentioned the patterns that you often see, uh, a nature-triggered technological disaster, that's a pattern that I see. The, that picture on the lower right, that's Fukushima. That was a weather-triggered technological disaster. It exposed a weakness in the uh, cool-down systems uh, due to the tsunami. Uh, less, not that much the earthquake directly, but the tsunami certainly exposed problems with their uh, safety discipline. The picture on the left is probably not so familiar. That's the <coughs> Bank Rio, and uh, there were two dams, two major dams that failed uh, in 1973, killed about 26,000 people in China. Uh, one of them was the Bank Rio, and the other was the Shimantan dams. They were supposed to be good against 500-year rainfalls. Well, they weren't. Um, typhoon came along, and, and when those two big dams failed upstream, it uh, took out 20, <coughs> 26 other dams in one night. So. We're making a fairly large and complicated world for ourselves. And again, I commend to your attention. It's a good thing to know about it. Um, sometimes you can make a difference. So for the new people, which you are going into the some Army Air Force, uh, maybe going into uh, some kind of, probably some kind of technology, these are the things that uh, I'm told by the people that I talk to um, that are trends that will probably be around for a few years. One is uh, rapid turnover of employees and contractors. That's a trend in petrochemical. Um, 
safety practice that are driven by computer models for two different purposes than it was designed for. Uh, see a lot of it in the oil industry. Um, this uh, SCADA is called Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. So a trend now is remotely operated plants. Some concern is there's actually no engineer there. Maybe some maintenance people who never worked on the plant, never maintained it. Uh, you see that now with some natural gas fired uh, power plants. There's no engineer on site. Uh, and it's actually not even run on the site. It's run over these computerized uh, devices called SCADA, which uh, a matter of some concern runs on the internet and was therefore arguably subject to uh, hackers and uh, uh, in fact that's what happened with the Iranian um, fuel enrichment plant. It's, uh, it's a SCADA run plant and somebody, probably uh, us and with help of the Israelis, got into their automatic controls and caused the system to go haywire. to sort of self <coughs> not self-control but self-destruct. High-speed centrifuges tearing themselves to pieces. Um, and so, although we can certainly say in a matter of theory, the regulators have the power to say you must shut down, and it is very influential when a plant has to shut down totally, it really gets their attention. It's very hard to do that. Like, not impossible exactly, but very, very difficult to do that, to say to a plant, you must close, you're too dangerous to run. It hardly ever happens. But then we know sometimes it's possible to do that when the thing just blows up or collapses, and this is the Highway 35 bridge. So that's kind of the default mode, that I'm afraid, is that you let it go until it crashes, and then everybody agrees, let's stop, because you can't go forward, the thing is crash. And then you can do it right. And I think, from what I know, uh, the rebuild of the 35 bridge has been done right. Uh, I wouldn't say that the study of that was, was complete in every detail, but um, when I, I use my own sources and follow the 35W bridge, and, just FYI, I found one interesting contributing factor to it that I don't think was really picked up on the investigative report, and that was that the surface would be milled at the time, and there were these bumps left. And so a truck would go down about two and a half inches and then come back up when it came to an expansion joint and then go back down again. It may not seem like much, you know, two, two and a half inches, but when you've got a truck weighing at least 80,000 pounds and probably more, there's a lot of illegally overweight trucks out there. That's a lot of force. Delivered in a small space. And I, I think that probably contributed uh, to the accident. But of course, uh, the causes in the Transportation Safety Board, I'm sure, were more important. Sometimes it's frustrating, though, isn't it? <laughs> I see things that not everybody agrees with. But I have a law, so I can put them in there. <laughs> uh, so, the uh, working on now are called Red Flags and Telltales. It's, uh, um, I was challenged by uh, the uh, fellow who wrote Normal Act. Normal accents. Uh, he did a review for the book, and um, he said you should really think about regulation and how to prevent these things, and not just how they happen. So I've been uh, musing on that. His name's Charles Perrow. Uh, how I might look forward and, and predict where something is chancy enough that it needs extra attention by regulators, or just maybe the industry should come down on them. Um, which is sort of the plan with the nuclear power. There's a thing called INPO, Institute for Nuclear Power Operators. And they theoretically are able to self-police the nuclear industry. And it's a great idea. I'd say it works a lot, but it doesn't always work. You may remember the Davis Bessie, uh, where the plant where they lost a lot of its pressure vessel due to boric acid corroded. Well, the only reason that was spotted was by coincidence. And they were within a half an inch. They lost about, I don't want to say over seven inches of thickness, and they're down to about a half an inch. Uh, that was totally inexcusable completely inexcusable, and INPO did not solve that problem. That was by coincidence when they were working on something absolute pressure was a subject of great concern to the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, but I, I hope people learn from that. So but that was, um, um, unfortunately, there may be no perfect way to regulate a complex industry, as, as the Japanese have found out. So a red flag is something that um, uh, we mostly look at it in retrospect, and we see that phrase in the news all the time, oh, that was a red flag, I should have spotted that. You heard a lot of that with the Deepwater Horizon explosion. But, you know, in fact, even red flags weren't that clear back in the steam days. Um, a red flag can mean several things. It didn't always mean stop or hurry. I put a picture in, and one thing which is totally unambiguous in the railroad field is called a railroad torpedo. 
So now that actually meant you must stop immediately. Go ahead, lock up the wheels. Very expensive proposition to lock up the wheels on a locomotive, but uh, it meant um, if you keep going, you're going to wreck. So to me, that's an even more vivid example than a red flag. <coughs> but how many people have heard of railroad torpedo? <laughs> that's a dilemma of a writer. You, you hear about more stuff than you can actually explain to people. Um, and this is an early alarm, actually. I thought it was interesting. It's an example of the steam days, how they had early alarms. Um, and uh, the alarm they had was called a telltale. And it actually told when the boiler was about, before the boiler blew up, which happened quite a bit in the steam days. Uh, somebody came up with a hollow bolt that would crack and spew steam out uh, in pretty much in the fireman's face and warn him that a uh, stable, which is necessary to hold the boiler together, had cracked. Actually, a very low technology, excellent way of, of an early alarm. Uh, a remarkable thing. So, uh, people in the steam days, I've I've gotten a huge amount of respect for both with the way they ran the railroads and built the bridges and ran the locomotives. Uh, it's it's uh, we'll go into it now, but it's it's most amazing. It's almost like they had to be a hundred years ahead of the time in designing the railroad system, a great deal more complex than the highway system now. Uh, the way they ran the railroads, it's a very admirable. So you may wonder, what am I doing now? Well, you'll see this if you have a history channel. I'll talk, talk a little bit about the Titanic. So uh, I had the opportunity, that's again why it's fun to do this kind of stuff, uh, to hang out with some guys called Lone Wolf Documentary on the show for the History Channel. So that's me on the left and then the other two guys, uh, very uh, interesting people, Park Stevenson in the middle and Ken Marshall. Um, uh, Ken is an illustrator, been down to the Titanic almost as much as James Cameron, and Parks is a historian, knows a great deal about the history of the Titanic and the wireless sets. So anyway, I had a chance to go into this hangar. And, uh, we didn't see the dark ship. <laughs> this is all done uh, in CGI, but I think it'll be pretty cool. And this will be out on April 15th, so that's the fun thing about being a writer. Uh, sometimes you get to uh, spend time with people doing uh, very cool things you wouldn't be able to otherwise. But let's talk a little bit about lessons for Titanic. So, because uh, I'm not a, a Titanic expert, I'm mainly about evacuation uh, and about the general patterns and, and accidents and locations I have the History Channel have either you know, the pattern. So there's the Titanic and its launching ways, uh, almost done. There's a diagram. Well, one lesson that came for me is that if you really know your world, you have a better chance of getting out of the Titanic. If you were in steerage, all third class or second class. I, I haven't even seen the darn movie, but I, I think it's conveyed in the camera movie about how if you're in steerage you had to go here and then go up the stairways and cut across and climb over a crane and all that to get to the boat deck. But somebody who really knew the ship, uh, and that's why it's good to study exit signs, would have known there was a stairway right up to the top <coughs> on the steward's stairway. Uh, you could just go right up to the boat. It was an unmarked door. But and you could also go into the engine room and there was a stairway up to the top called the engine case. So if somebody had really known that ship, they wouldn't have had to blunder around. Of course, most of the stairs people never made it through that circuitous way to get kind of like a letter Z to get to the boat deck. So given all the uh, accidents that have happened, my advice would be get to an upper part of the ship. Uh, you had your chances are better there than being way down low. Unfortunately, that's not always in line with what the assignments are for the lifeboats. And I'm just telling that's what I would do. I were on a ship, uh, and, uh, and there have been a good many close calls there, not just cruise ships, but it's, uh, I think, uh, regardless of the coast of Concordia, the, uh, the greatest risk to a cruise ship, it by far, is out in the middle of the ocean, uh, particularly where it encounters uh, rough seas and it gets into a thing called the parametric roll, where the ship actually starts going like this and can roll over. There's a, an amazing picture, you'll find it on my blog, it's actually a movie of, uh, called the uh, was it's uh, Pacific Sun uh, a few years ago got into a parametric roll, and uh, you'll see that there's like a 40 degree roll. <coughs> Pretty amazing they got back. Uh, parametric roll is a phenomenon where the ship is going right into the waves, and it just happens to match the frequency of the wave. It's kind of like pushing on a swing. You know, if you push on a swing, eventually the kid will go into the trees. Well, it's like the waves are just pushing perfectly on the. Uh, 
on this cruise ship. So they came very close. In fact, the helicopter that was monitoring it took pictures of the underside of the hull. That's a pretty extreme role when <laughs> you can see underneath, see the bottom of the hole. So evacuation, those are some of the lessons from the Titanic. Uh, a situation awareness, um, uh, sort of watching out for yourself. Um, as a hobbyist, I try to track the events that could have happened. You know, uh, sometimes it's called the past, you know, where history takes a turn. The Titanic was one of those. And so when I was working on the History Channel thing, I, at least I became interested. What would have happened what if the Titanic had gotten to New York? Where would it have landed? Because I'm kind of a New York history buff. Well, it's in this ad. It would have landed um, on piers 59 and 60 at the White Star Pier. And in our, you see that in our, that's their term in the 1915, 1912 area for the Hudson River. So that's where the Titanic would have landed had it survived. But instead, you had this um, totally avoidable situation. You had uh, this lifeboat, which was called a collapsible. And you had uh, ice warnings ignored with the thought the captain had his own priorities, not, not reckless, but perhaps he was Captain Smith, that he needed to get uh, to port on time as part of the sales point of this, but he was not trying to break any records. Uh, it was more of an institutionalized culture that the ship should be on time, and other people have to slow down, but not us. Until we see an iceberg, that was the culture for the Titanic and other ships, until we see the darn thing, we're not going to slow down. And then we'll, we'll have a reason to slow down. Kind of expensive way to think about things. Uh, so this uh, picture, again, my optimism is, and I don't say this is possible for every endeavor. I don't claim that it is, but I do hold it up for it as a model, naval reactors program, where something absolutely must be done right. Uh, I don't know if you're science fiction fans are familiar with thing called the space elevator, the notion of having a big, essentially a core that you can send elevators up. Very demanding technology. I hope we build it one day. But it will be very, very marginal as far as what can be done with the materials. Right now we can't build it. We have no materials to do that. But if we ever are able to build it, it will be very, very marginal uh, as far as actually working. So that's the kind of thing that you would want a Hyman Rickover for, who started the Naval Reactors Program for the Navy. He did impossible things. Uh, they still look impossible now, even in retrospect. Uh, talk to his son some, talk to people in his program. And I guess the bottom line is that they went from uh, nuclear reactors that were just piles of bricks in 1945 to a high power, high performance uh, power reactor for underwater purposes that wouldn't kill everybody on board in less than 10 years, and actual construction was less than five years. And even more amazing than that was he was willing to do a full stop to that program. There was a and even though he was in a big rush, he staked his reputation on getting this thing built in three to five years. You know, the impossible sub, he still wanted to do it three to five years. He actually stopped his program when every other bureaucrat would have just covered it up because he had heard about a problem where somebody had used the wrong kind of piping in a return line. And nobody could be exactly sure where that bad piping had been put into in the reactor room. So he said, let's tear it all out. That's 3,000 feet of pipe. Very difficult. The spaces are much more tight than anything in your attic, even if you cram your attic full of stuff. That's something like uh, the engine room over the top of the Nautilus. They took all that piping out, three month halt, and then the, the guys who worked for him said, Well, I'm sure you want to keep this quiet, right? And he said, No, I want you to go and tell everybody that we screwed up and we stopped the program for three months to fix it. And you know what his point was? That word will get out, and it did. Nothing spoke louder to the people of the naval reactors and the contractors who worked on it that he was willing to stand up, stop the program, and do it right. Nothing else, no speech, nothing else would do that job. But that story really got around. And so uh, um, that's actually one way to determine the health of a safety organization is what stories do people tell each other. That's the best single indication of how safe they are. So what stories do they tell each other down in the ranks. Whenever I go to some place, I ask, like, uh, went to jet, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory one time, I said, please can I go after midnight? And they said, why? Well, because that's when we were about your organization. So I was there to watch them do some transmissions with the Voyager spacecraft. But it was important to me to, and whenever I, on the, was on the uh, 
uh, Discover Enterprise uh, Transocean drillship in the Gulf of Mexico to be able to be there for several days and have a report that. Just stick around, be a follower, <laughs> I'll forget you're there. That's really cool. You're no longer a reporter, you're just some guy hanging around. And that's when by far the best reporting can be done. Because they forget you're there, and plus they can't get rid of you either. That's the advantage of being on a drillship. Is 120 miles from shore, we can't just tell you to get lost. <laughs> Uh, particularly if you keep a low profile. So that's one thing that I learned to do, which is stay out of the control room and just uh, stay on the edge and watch things happen. And things did happen. It was very interesting. So, uh, you know, if you're curious what I do and, and this uh, more stuff on the History Channel, I'll be describing some of the technology they use for this film, uh, check out the blog. And uh, who knows what it, they, uh, they might be doing some more shows like that in History Channel. So I'm saying, I'm doing We'll so uh, I'm going to have time for a, little, a few questions if you have, or uh, any of those. Or <clears throat> best thing would be maybe in coming to your classes, we'll uh, have a invited disaster book. That's probably the best way to get uh, is to do the book. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah, I got a question about the, the cigarette thing and the planes. So are they doing something different now to, to see those since people don't smoke on planes well, anymore? There's, yeah, there's a non destructive method you can use, you know, uh, uh, basically putting. A colorant over that. Um, that's typical for uh, finding cracks in metal. Okay. Um, they can use x rays. And they, they, there are certain places where the cracks are likely to form you know, near the wings, for yeah. example. So it's just a matter of looking at it very closely uh, with, with some kind of microscopy. But it's, it's not always easy to see them. <laughs> It's where those plates overlap and there's rivets. The cracks nearly always start from the rivets that join the overlap plates. So it's not all that complicated, but it's time consuming. I just thought for a second you're going to. Yeah, I thought for a second there would be an argument there for reinstating smoking on planes. But. <laughs> well, but I mean, could that end up to be hard art or anything, but they rarely lead to the aircraft being destroyed. So, I mean, they, although by airlines, they did lose a person. And I don't know, in other words, I'm trying to think, why would the airlines, you know, have this happen now and then? I think it's because they believe the airplanes are going to last longer than they do. But, but I guess they should know by now, well, some of these airplanes have made 50 to 80,000 landings and takeoffs, and it's, that's where you have this full pressurization and depressurization. So, and that's the case of all airlines. It was always going up from one island, landing on another, and that's generally to a 737. They're short haul planes. But, you know, to, in defense of Boeing, the 737 is an extremely, it's not perfect, but it's had some crashes. But it's an amazing airplane. Uh, Southwest Airlines uses 737 and has had extremely good safety record. Well, one of the best, even though they make a lot of short-haul flights. So it's really more than the airline that has more to do with what you take, how you take care of it and how you think ahead. It's an important thing is thinking ahead and, and acting before you have to act. That's the sign of a bad organization. Because we won't do anything until we have to. Or that have to be used is after there's an explosion or a fire. So. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> Maybe you could talk a minute about um, what you see as the difference between heedlessness and recklessness. Oh, good question. Yeah. Heedlessness, it's uh, despite um, common sense that you're in a dangerous place. There's a feeling that it's a rationalization. So if you see people rationalizing, that's a sign of heedlessness. It won't happen to me, that's the main rationalization. If it always happens to some other guy, some loser, it won't happen to me because I'm special. And you know, most people believe they're above average. It's not possible for most people to be above average, but they think they are. And so it's that it's rationalization, it's the human ability to reason itself out of hard work, it's kind of laziness. Uh, you saw a lot of that uh, heedlessness on the, the uh, Discovery Enterprise, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Deepwater Horizon, um, where for one thing it was a handoff, and that heedlessness concentrated on one particular phase, which was, they called abandonment, a bad choice of word, abandonment. It was really just a temporary sealing of the well, but in the culture of BP, kind of like, this is not a money-making thing, and it didn't help at all to call it an abandonment even though there had been a number of accidents connected to abandonment, it would have been a lot better to call it temporary sealing in favor of a later profitable endeavor or something. And they, they put the guys, the second stringers, on the abandonment, and 
the modeling, they, the funny thing is they had intensively modeled the front end of that, but then nobody modeled or really cared about the abandonment. Even though they're making all kinds of changes on the fly, they didn't redo the safety analyses that they had done at the first. And so it was kind of like a sort of a paper exercise. They did the safety, the safety modeling, but then they stopped doing it at the most important time. Why? Because it cost them a lot of money. That was one reason. And they felt, well, it hadn't blown up before. Uh, and you'll see that pattern a lot, as there had been close calls. But unfortunately, the storytelling of the organization was, if there had been close calls before and we didn't die, then that must mean it's OK. And that's that normalization of deviance that you saw with uh, criticism Diane Vaughn made of NASA of after Challenger and then after Columbia, which is, we pushed the envelope, we survived, and so that now becomes the new norm. So you can push it a little bit further. And, and also combined with the philosophy that it'd be too embarrassing to have a full stop, even though after Challenger and after Columbia, there was a full stop. Very few people, uh, with the exception of Rick Hover, have ever understood the wisdom of a full stop. Because it actually improves your credibility. People actually think, hey, this guy is not lying to us like everybody else. And, and in fact, when Rick Hover broke rules, he would go to Congress and say, you've told me to do certain things, and I'm telling you that I'm going to break them. Because they're stupid. I can't get the job done by following your rules. So I'm going to break them. Would anybody like to stop me? I mean, basically, that's what he did. Of course, he had a tremendous amount of political power before he did that. But it just amazed people. I think Mark Twain said, uh, you know, if you tell the truth, it will amaze people. Uh, and and Rick Over did it. It's just it's a story that's profoundly amazing throughout uh, how he did all this without ever hardly captaining a ship. It's like he took over the Navy, although he really had no experience captaining a ship. I don't know, the guy, uh, it's almost like he landed from another planet or something. So there's so many lessons about Rick over and how we did things. So that's why I say, if you ever do a space elevator, look at the story behind Rick over. That would be good. So any other questions? I have, another, I have one more about, just real quick. If you, could, you mentioned disaster, cataclysm, and okay. catastrophe. Yeah, disaster, catastrophe is the next worst. Okay. That's like a turning. And the cataclysm is where it's beyond recovery, and it typically never comes back. So. If, for example, we had a space elevator and it were to collapse, that would possibly would be a cataclysm in the sense that we would never do it again. I mean, think of fusion reactors. We have a near miss uh, with a breeder reactor in uh, uh, Enrico Fermi plant near Detroit, near the book, we almost lost Detroit. That had a lot to do with not pursuing breeder reactors in this country. That was a cataclysm if you were in the breeder reactor. Industry because all the faith went away. So it could be an economic cataclysm, not just like, you know, depopulating an area. So not that cataclysm is a word used all that much, but when I say when you scale it, there's accidents, there's disasters, there's catastrophes, and the worst is a cataclysm. <clears throat> it never recovers. The system never comes back, which is, you know, quite a, quite a shame technologically because there may be something that's very promising that collapsed due to a stupid error. I mean, like everybody suffers due to the one small team's stupid error because the faith goes away. And it almost went away with Apollo 13. But it's kind of an heroic incident now, but it wasn't seen that way at the time at all. It was like a major screw up with the Apollo 13. Uh, the movie made a heroic event out of it, but that was so avoidable, the Apollo 13, that it almost brought the space program to an early end. It came very close. So that was not, to me, a happy story. Happy ending, but it's not a happy story. So, I don't know, does that help cataclysm? Yeah, I, was, uh, I guess my question was really the difference between the disaster and the catastrophe. Where's, where's that? Disaster is more of a local thing. Uh, disaster literally means bad star. People saw it, you know, bad luck. So, I mean, disaster is the most common animal in the zoo. Um, and I, I, I guess I uh, use that because it's a word that's commonly understood. And uh, catastrophe is probably overused. So anyway, oh, I uh, there's, actually, I was suggesting to the publisher to turn courting disaster, but they said, no, nah, that's too old. It's called inviting disaster, because it's sort of a catchphrase. Uh, if I had said inviting cataclysm, they would have said, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know what that is. Unfortunately, that's good, because that means there aren't enough of them to know what the word is. So that's good. Uh, oh, well, thanks for your attention. Appreciate it. Cool, thanks.